They just faced each other as owners in the NBA playoffs. Now Dan Gilbert and Tom Gores want to get behind the same team. Is Detroit ready for Major League Soccer? We'll kick it around. Today is May 1st, 2016, and this is Flashpoint. All right, welcome to Flashpoint. Today is the first day of May. Now, we're just into baseball season in Detroit, but if the plans announced this week come to fruition, this would eventually be the middle of the soccer season, too. There's probably an adage in a book of wisdom somewhere about being careful anytime two billionaires get together with a plan, but there's no denying its fascination. Downtown revolutionary and Cleveland Cavaliers owner Dan Gilbert teaming up with Detroit Pistons owner Tom Gores with a billion dollar plan that would bring Major League Soccer to a city that we're told is at the top of the MLS wish list. But this is about more than soccer because the target for the new stadium is the mess that is the Wayne County Jail Project. Are Gilbert and Gore is giving the county an out to absorb some of those wasted dollars or is it a pressurized grab for land from a seller with no leverage? And before we even get to the address of the stadium, is Detroit ready to support another major league team? We're going to talk about all that this morning. Matt Cullen from Rock Ventures is here to make the case. We've got a roundtable raring to go on it. And also this morning, we're going to say so long to one of the best friends this program has ever had. It's all this morning on Flashpoint. Well, soccer, of course, is the world game. It has taken a little longer to take root in America, but all of a sudden we're ready to grow a mighty soccer oak in downtown Detroit, but it's complicated. Let's talk about the we announcement of this past week with the head of Rock Ventures, Matt Cullen. Matt, thanks very much for the time after your big week. Absolutely. Good morning, Devin. I want to talk a little bit about a lot of the complications sure. of this, but let's start with just whether or not uh, the certainty is there that Detroit is ready for, for soccer, this game that, as I mentioned, has been slow to become what it is elsewhere. In the no, world. no, that's right. But uh, we, we really are confident that it is. I mean, and, and more importantly, the, the uh, Major League Soccer guys are. I mean, Don Garber and these guys, we, yeah. we are like either the first or the second largest community across the United States that doesn't have a team. Um, and, and they were 97, 98,000 kids playing it and registered uh, teams around here uh, in, the, in the state of Michigan. But it's really interesting, and I think uh, Detroit uh, Football Club and others have demonstrated that this, the experience of soccer, it's not what, he, when he came in town, he said, you know, it used to be, the, they thought that the uh, parents of the kids, the kids would drag the parents. And that's really not it. It's an urban sport. Uh -huh. It's a sport that people want to come together and have fun. When the World Cup was there, we opened up the, the uh, big uh, TV screens on Calix Square. It was packed. It was jammed. And so yeah, it was crazy. I think that that, that that whole atmosphere and the experience of soccer is something that's very, uh, alive it's expanding dramatically and it's urban and that's really an interesting thing and it's urban in in their own facility so they can they can celebrate it the right way MLS season runs from the middle of the spring to the middle of the fall so it kind of mirrors baseball but it's your finding and your understanding that it really doesn't seem to cannibalize off of other sports it's kind of its own thing it really enough. it really is I mean it, it, it seems to be very much a uh, the fans of soccer are their own group um, Again, Don Garber, the, the uh, commissioner of MLS, was in yesterday, and he said the most specific example they have in, is in Atlanta. And the football fans and, and, the, and the soccer team, the overlap on season tickets is 3%. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it's a yeah. totally different group. Yeah. And obviously the soccer is, is, a, is a key component of this, but it's really the context of this sports and entertainment district, this mixed-use thing, that, that, that the additional hotel retail, and the creation of this, uh, this heat map of activity in the center of Detroit, four major uh, sports teams yeah. uh, and, and, and in a connected district is, is really the energy we're looking for as well. It also comes with an interesting synergy between two guys who just a week ago were That's at right. loggerheads because their teams were playing each other in the NBA playoffs. So you've got That's these right. two very powerful, very wealthy men and one of the first reactions when, they, when people saw this 20 to 25,000 seat stadium was how much public money is going to go into it because these guys don't need public help. They can build it their own. Well, and your answer it tended to be that the bulk of it was going to be private money, but not all of it. Well, and, and my answer to that, I, I, mean, I need to back up a step and say, look, we're really talking about a solution to a the future of the city of Detroit. So part of it was, do we want to build this jail here? So in, I'm going to get to the location well, in a minute. But, but, but I do want to tie it to that because as a part of that, there's all these infrastructure discussions and a whole bunch of things. So when I hesitate to say that every uh, every dollar will be spent by the uh, the owners, by 
definition, there's infrastructure and other things that are going to be a part of any development on a site, including the jail and other things that need to be talked about. But, but I, I think that if you look at the track record of Don, uh, of Dan Gilbert, who's come into the city with very little support from a sort of financial incentive standpoint, we're up to 95 buildings and, and, and two and a half billion dollars and 15,000 team members. It's not a guy who, who has been looking for someone to, to take on his, his work, right? And, uh, and I would say the same about Tom. So uh, you don't have guys who are coming in here trying to figure out uh, how to scrape the money together. Uh, they're coming in here with a powerful vision of, of what could uh, be accomplished here. Which is why this is such a daunting and uh, impressive proposal, of course. But it's also now let's get to the location sure. issue of this, which is very complicated uh, to try and take what has been a $150 million mess for the county. Yeah. It's not as simple as just taking it off their books. Nope. Uh, it's costing, though, the county over a million dollars a month in debt service right now. So this also needs to happen fairly quickly, it would seem, if there's going to be a change. But why say there's no plan B? Why say that this is where it has to go? Well, because it seemed kind of uh, uh, forceful to some, unduly forceful. You know, and I would understand how people think that way, but I mean, I would have to back up and say, the, really, the reason we got involved is because we think fundamentally the new jail and locking in a criminal justice complex at the gateway of the city of Detroit for the next 50 years is the wrong choice. I mean, and so when, when to your point, it, it, it fell apart last time under Bob Facano, mm -hmm. and he came to us and said, we can't finish this. It's a mess. We don't know what right. to do with it. Will you buy it? We had no use for it, literally no use for the site at the time, but we said, yes, we'll pay $50 million for the site in order to help you, you know, do something alternatively so that you don't exacerbate what we should think is a problem. And we said, but conversely, if somebody else is prepared to pay $50 million, we will, you know, shake their hand and thank them because we think fundamentally, as we have this opportunity, this inflection point in the, in the in the development of the city of Detroit, the opportunity to create this massive entertainment and sports district is something that's really unprecedented. And so we had that coming from one side, and then we married it with the MLS and, and this mixed use thing, and we said, okay, here, here's, because Warren Evans appropriately, the county exec said to us, I don't want to hear about generalities, give me something so specific. specific. Well, in so, fact, by giving him something specific, you certainly, the price went up by a lot more than $50 million, uh, because now that everybody knows you want it, uh, that was an interesting negotiation on Wednesday. Well, I, 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 again, I'd put it a little bit differently. What Warren Evans has said from the beginning is, he's open to either outcome, and he certainly gets that there might be a better solution yeah. there than the jail. But the numbers have to balance, and so what Warren now has committed to do with, with us and others is to do a side-by-side -side study of, of Mound and, uh, and Gratiot, understand exactly what the delta is, and then find out if there's a way to fix it. Stephen Henderson wrote that, this, that, that your uh, presentation was a bit apocryphal and potentially dangerous <laughs> because uh, part of this, moving it way out to Mound, uh, does create a, a real hardship on a lot of poor people who don't, you know, who need to get to the jail and will now no, not really have great access to it. In most cities, and I agree with you about not having it be your gateway to your downtown, but in most cities, those kind of things are somewhere downtown, aren't they? Well, they're somewhere accessible. Because you also have to move Frank Murphy Hall of Justice and the 36th District Court. It's not just well, the Well, the 36th District Court is actually unrelated, but, but, um, but, but to, to, to Stephen's point, and, and he and I spoke about it yesterday, I totally agree with him. It needs to be someplace that's accessible, and he, he said that uh, at one time people were talking about it being at the former Tiger Stadium site or something. Personally, I'm not saying it has to be at Mound Road. Mound Road is one site that the, has been made available by the state because they own yeah. the property. But the, the real fundamental assessment is what does it cost to create essentially a greenfield versus to complete this failed jail? What does it cost? And, what's the, and, and, yeah. and to the extent there's a delta, how do we deal with it? The location as to Mount Road or another one, there's, there's plenty of places where there are 15 acres of property in the city. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so that's another conversation I think that could happen concurrently. Yeah. Um, when you hear people sort of want to vilify, I've wanted to ask you this for some time, Dan Gilbert, when people talk about Gilbertville, I don't think they mean it in a particularly um, mm -hmm. flattering way. He's clearly remade downtown in so many different ways. And when you hear him sort of vilified that way, uh, as if he's a kind of a snidely whiplash, what, how do you feel? 
uh, you know, it's it, uh, it, it it's hurtful, really. I mean, I, I can't think of another word because it really isn't Dan at all, right? I mean, Dan came down here with the idea that we could make a difference in the city of Detroit. And at the time that everyone was leaving the city, in 2010, I mean, the Time Magazine had been the year before, you know, the tragedy of the city of Detroit. Yeah. And Dan came down and said, let's try and make a difference. It's his hometown, it's my hometown, a lot of us grew up here, and we said, look, we think we can make a difference and we want to be a part of the solution. So we came downtown. And then through a confluence of great events, which is the mortgage business improved, uh, we had a terrific company at Quicken Loans. We were suddenly in an area where the demographics where these bright young kids wanted to come, we were able to scale. So we came down with 1,700 people. We now have 15,000 team members. We grew here in the city of Detroit. That in turn allowed us to, to buy additional buildings because we needed the capacity. We wanted to do it in Detroit. It allowed us to recruit another 200 people, to, 200 companies to come down. The philosophy has been do good and do well. And I think that people misunderstand Dan and, and aren't aware of the full picture if they have that perception. Does it hurt him or does that stuff roll off his back? I think it uh, a little of both. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I, I think because of uh, his genuine commitment and love for the city uh, and support for the city, it, it hurts, but uh, conversely, he's a big guy that's been in the uh, public life for a long time. And by definition, you know, if you're doing some big things in a community and anywhere, right, I mean, you have a tendency to attract uh, detractors as well. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's a surprise to him, but I, I think he continues to believe that as we uh, can articulate uh, what's going on, that people will have a better understanding. Well, we're going to kick that around, kick that soccer ball around a little bit more with our roundtable in just a second. Matt, I really appreciate you being here. Terrific. Thank, Thank you, you, Devin. And we'll continue with more on this. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. We'll be right back. Welcome back. That was a lot to chew on there from Matt Cullen. Let's talk about it with this morning's roundtable. Boudini is with us. Great to have <laughs> Drew Sharp, sports columnist from the Free Press, is here. Uh, former Detroit City Council member Sheila Cockrell is with us, and my colleague here at Local 4, our business editor, Rod Maloney. Uh, I, I guess I'm going to start the same way I did with Matt, Drew. Before we get to the ad, the real estate <laughs> part of this, let's, is, is Detroit ready, you think? It's been a crazy success story watching Detroit FC, but that's a different scale than what we need to happen with Major right. League Soccer. Is Detroit ready? Ready for this. I don't think so. I don't think Detroit is really a soccer town, mm. but it is a sports town. I think that's part of the rationalization to try to get MLS in here and try to get them downtown. You have the movers and shakers here who think that sports can somehow gravitate an audience to the only part of the city that's probably salvageable, and that's downtown. Mm. I just don't think soccer, long term, can be a success story in this town. Even with watch, watching what's happened, I mean, we're, you have, obviously it's a different scale, but Detroit FC having the standing room only with their, and having to move to a bigger stadium uh, with their crowds and uh, the songs and the whole experience. I'm sure that you have, a niche, hockey is a niche sport. No, soccer no. is even a smaller niche sport. <laughs> you know, I like soccer every four years when the World Cup is, <laughs> is playing. I think a lot of us love the, the big events when it's soccer, it's like uh -huh. the Olympics. But to, to have the support for this sport to, to be successful every year in here for it to, to make to make profit, I just don't see it. It's interesting, Sheila. I've got a, a lot of friends who've got uh, season tickets to uh, KC Sporting, which is the Kansas mm -hmm. City uh, team. They would far rather go to a soccer game with their families than a Chiefs game or a Royals game because, number one, it's a lot cheaper. Number mm -hmm. two, soccer's very manageable. You're in and out in about two hours because right. it's just 45 minute has with rolling clocks. But what are your thoughts on Well, to me, I mean, I'm, I'm not a big sports person. Mm -hmm. That should be my first. Disclaimer here. Um, so, which left you with a lot of fun decisions when you were on council. I, know. That, I learned a lot, and, <laughs> yeah. and that was fine. I learned about building them. And, but um, a couple things. One, to Drew's point that downtown's the only part of the city that's salvageable. I, I really don't think that's the the full narrative right now. Number one. Number two. I think soccer, to the extent that I am kind of. I see it on Morning Joe sometimes mm -hmm. uh, when that guy comes on from England and does the reporting. <laughs> it's clearly a very um, global sport. It's uh -huh. a cosmopolitan sport. If you look in our region, there are people from all kinds of countries where soccer is a major, uh, major sport. And who knows? It might be a way of creating, uh, you know, an additional reason for lots of folks yeah. who are not coming downtown to come downtown. I should, in full disclosure, I'm, I'm a soccer nut and played okay. a lot of it as a kid, and I'm, I'm in the bag for it. But mm -hmm. it, I, I also thought, Rod, that when I was young, I thought, oh, by the time I'm older, it will have finally caught fire, and it's been, it's been slow to do that. Well, I, I think that the point that there are 90,000 kids playing soccer in Detroit, all my kids played soccer, they loved mm -hmm. the game, yep. um, and I think that, that that will be helpful, but I'm not sure my kids would want to go to have season tickets. They might come to a game, might come to 
too, a couple of games. The long, the long-term sustainability of the sport, uh, I think, is in hmm. question. I kind of come down in the middle here. I'm not as negative uh, as Drew is, but I'm also not as positive as Sheila is about it. I think that there are a lot of problems, and the notion of it being a long-term sport. I mean, let's let's think. The, the Michigan had uh, in the old USFL, right? We had the Detroit Express, the the, the, the championship team, and the mm -hmm. Panthers, right? Um, way back when, oh, the championship the, yeah. team. Uh, let's, not, let's not talk football now. Yeah, yeah. No, no. <laughs> well, that's true now. We can't the Lions. You know. No, but my point is, is that that team, which won the championship, couldn't sustain an audience. The league right. couldn't sustain an audience. So yeah. you have that question. Then I, I'm from New England originally, and New England has absolutely embraced their soccer team, mm -hmm. and they pack that stadium yeah. Every, yeah. every game. So I, I think it has a shot. The long-term sustainability, yeah, I'm not so sure about. Then how did you feel on, on this rollout with there's no plan B? Yeah. <laughs> we, it's got, we want it right here at this uh, where the jail site is. Right, because I think they're more interested in building the office space, having the retail and the hotels. This is what, this is what the grand schemers always do with Detroit. They envision these great sparkling new buildings, and then once they're built, how do you get them filled? That's the problem right now. You know, you have to find a way to get people downtown, and that's why you use sports as a kind of a hook to get everyone interested in it. You know, the, the group that, that every year uh, submits uh, phrases that need to go out of vogue, mm -hmm. I, I'll be glad when we're done with mixed use because, yes, <laughs> that, is the, that is our favorite thing. But, uh, Sheila, you've obviously got, uh, I, I think uh, Dan Gilbert and Tom Gores are trying to tell us, look, we can solve two problems with one stone here. You've got a jail that has been a financial disaster. But from your public policy sure. uh, viewpoint, is that the way to solve this? Well, I, I, I certainly don't think it's ruled out. I was very happy to hear Matt talk about doing a side-by-side -side study mm -hmm. to determine what, what the costs are, what the implications are. I think the issue that's raised about citing is really important for the courts, uh, for the prosecutor's office in relationship to, to a jail. So personally, I think it's a good, uh, it's an opportunity to take a, a really hard look at a, uh, a situation that needs a resolution. I know that the county exec has uh, people looking at sort of the costs and the way you, you would build, could build there on the current site and make it be cost effective. Uh, so I, I just, I think it's, it's what's a good the, thing what's to talk the right, about. What's the ethical way to look at this if I, as, a, as a Wayne County taxpayer? Sure. Do I expect, should I expect them to make us whole on this mess that's cost so much? Should I expect them to just uh, let us lose less than we were otherwise going to lose? What's my reasonable expectation? I think the re personally, I think the reasonable expectation is that Wayne County taxpayers won't won't have to pay any more than what was originally bonded for, and anything that has to go beyond that, there has to be another strategy. To, uh, to figure out how to pay for it. And Rod, you've covered this from the very beginning. You, you, you know more than you want to yes, about, precisely, about what's yes. happened with this jail. So, so weigh in. Matt talked about a delta. Mm -hmm. The delta is probably, in just the rough math in my head, a quarter of a billion. Because what we're forgetting here is that he tried to say, he said that the courthouse isn't that important. No, the courthouse is the fulcrum of it. 150 mil, it was 130 two years ago, it's likely 150 mil or more just to build the courthouse out on Mound Road. Mound Road currently is a prison, it is not a jail. Which is a very different thing. And, and the conversion to that is exceptionally expensive. It's a $300 million project where it sits. You know, just because you have the buildings around you, you still have to make them fit. And, and I just, I think it's a quarter of a billion dollars, and you're talking about a $1.2 billion project that needs a lot of profitability, and then you're going to put another quarter of a bill on top of that? Uh, I, I'm not so sure. And, and remember that Warren Evans didn't exactly ask for this. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was sort of it brought Almost upon him. Yes, yes. yes exactly. And, and so I don't think he's going to have a sense of humor. It better pay for itself. This now takes us around to the bigger picture, though, Drew, as we're watching this uh, Red Wings arena. Well, sorry, I guess I need to start calling it Little Caesars Arena. Arena, Arena. <laughs> arena, <laughs> arena. Yeah. Yeah, stadium, stadium. <laughs> we're watching this take shape where, again, it's the, the, the view of that is much more than a sports venue. Mixed use in a lot of different ways, creating a neighborhood really. But I think um, there, there seems to be a certain skepticism among a lot of us now that y you can't expect a sports palace to really create all of this lateral success. It doesn't just it doesn't, yeah, there do it economic that way. studies that have shown that that you know you can build all these new new palaces. It doesn't. There isn't a ripple effect that brings jobs aside from those who are doing the, the stadium vending on game nights. What it does it. Re-energize it, rejuvenates the, the the civic spirit. It makes and it sports, fun, and sports yeah. does do that There's in no Detroit more so than other cities. I completely agree. So 
it's good from that standpoint that you have a new f facility. Tear down Joe Lewis, maybe you can expand Kobo and have a first-rate convention center. Mm -hmm. That could bring some more activity to, to the city. But you, you can't look at it strictly from a standpoint that this is going to create the jobs that need to be down there. What it does, it makes you feel better same thing that, you know, we have a, a state-of-the-art hockey facility, maybe a basketball facility as well, down there as well. <laughs> and everything is right there together in an entertainment area that people want to come in from the suburbs, that's fine. But you got to get people living down right. there, working down there and living down there for, 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 for the situation in downtown Detroit to really be solved. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, one of the things, I mean, and, and looking at the, and I've not studied it very carefully, the, uh, the new, new uh, hockey arena, the build, there's five different neighborhoods that are part of being, that are part of that. And as my understanding is I don't think it's sort of like we're going to build the stadium of the hockey arena and then this stuff is going to happen. The work it's, has begun. There's literally, there's 50 uh, blocks that are going to be um, energized and it's going to be, it's not all about the, the, it, the hockey arena, it's about building neighborhoods. It's one of the most like, comprehensive visions yes, of ever seen around that, a stadium, if you it's true. At all at the 7.2 square mile report, this is the greater downtown report, the, da the data shows that there people are trying to move into downtown Detroit, into Midtown, into Corktown, into Eastern Market. There are people who want to live here. It's an important part of the conversation, but I would want, need to say it isn't the only part of the conversation. The longer one is what's happening in the neighborhoods, and there are very good things beginning to happen in many of the neighborhoods. The I have seconds. a couple of thoughts. Uh, Quickly. You know, Dan Gilbert's vision of turning Detroit into downtown Chicago is an interesting vision. Um, and, and I think that in many ways, until you get the school system right, mm. I don't think you're going to get that kind of expansion. Time, you know, we, and we could spend another whole half well. hour on that. So I think uh, saving that, I think it's going to be fits and starts here. Thank you all very much. Great conversation. A lot of different things to think about on a very complicated piece of thinking. Uh, when we come back, we'll say so long to Paul Weldon. This is Flashpoint. that Donald Trump really was the reason it was nuts. Let's face it. I mean, if, if you don't have a problem with his tone and his temperament and his dis demeanor, I, I think I, I worry about you, frankly. Because <laughs> <laughs> Finally this morning, we bid a sad farewell to a very important member of our Flashpoint family, Paul Welday. For more than a decade, he was a part of our Sunday morning salon here, but for much longer than that, he was a vital and energetic part of the Michigan political scene, from acting as Congressman Joe Nolenberg's chief of staff to his recently announced run for Oakland County Water Commissioner and a million things in between. Yes, Paul was a dedicated conservative, a reliably Republican voice on the topics of the day, but the outpouring of sadness over his death this week came from those on both sides of the aisle because Paul had that wonderful and sadly all too rare capacity to disagree without being disagreeable. He was so very dedicated to the causes and campaigns for which he labored, but even more dedicated to his two children, his son Nicholas and his daughter Natalie and his wife Valerie. With Paul laid to rest yesterday, our thoughts are with them today. Thank you, Paul. Meet the Press is next. We'll see you next week on Flashpoint.